Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Heather Himmelberger, Director at the Southwest Environmental Finance Center. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a beautiful day here in Albuquerque, and I'm hoping that it's not too cold or snowy or rainy wherever you are today. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, which is a rebroadcast of a session we did in November. And I want to thank the Syracuse Environmental Finance Center for hosting and recording today's webinar. And I want to thank Don Nall of the Southwest EFC for helping facilitate the webinar. As a reminder, you can post questions in the chat box at any time during the webinar and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. Also, we will be preventing a f presenting a few asset management videos as part of this webinar. Due to the difficulties with streaming the video portion, we'll be showing still pictures while the audio plays. This webinar is part of the Environmental Finance Center Network's project called Smart Management for Small Water Systems. This project is funded by EPA and allows us to provide managerial and financial capacity assistance to small water systems all across the country. In this context, a small water system is defined as one serving 10,000 people or fewer. We have provided a series of in-person workshops on asset management, rates and finance, energy efficiency, water loss, access to funding, and water system collaboration. Hopefully, some of you were able to attend one of those in-person events. As part of this project, we are also holding webinars in most, most of these topic areas to accommodate individuals who were not able to receive in-person training or who wanted to learn about something else besides what they learned about in their in-person training. Today's webinar is part of the Asset Management series of webinars. We held five webinars in November and December on asset management. Today's webinar is a rebroadcast of the first webinar that was held. We are recording today's session and it will be posted on the EFCN website. The other four webinars are currently posted there. Each of the webinars is standalone and covers a particular aspect of asset management. You can listen to any of the webinars that have been presented as part of this project on the EFCN website at efcnetwork.org. We've also provided a map today of the people who signed up for our training, just to give you an idea of where people are, and we pretty, have a pretty good spread across the country of people who are watching this video today. So again, welcome everyone, and hope you enjoy today's webinar. So we're going to start with a poll question to give you a chance to say what you think asset management is. So Tara, if we could start the poll. <clears throat> We have some choices for you, um, and please select the best one. Asset management is a new concept for me, a management process we are currently implementing, or a concept I'm familiar with but haven't begun to implement. So go ahead and select the um, response that best describes uh, where you are in the process right now. We'll give it a few more seconds, give people a chance to vote. So it looks like that um, we have about 60% of our folks, or it's a concept that I'm familiar with but haven't begun to implement. And that's good. Hopefully today's webinar will give you some tools to help you think a little bit more about how you can begin to implement the process and what you can do to get started. The formal definition of asset management is delivering the level of service you desire at the lowest life cycle cost. In practical terms, it means that you are providing your customers what they want at the most appropriate cost. In today's world, the biggest benefit to asset management is that it allows you to determine how to spend your limited dollars in the best way possible. We no longer have enough money to do everything we need to do with our assets, so we have to make choices. When we make the right choices about spending our money, we can still have a very effective utility and meet our customer expectations, even with the reduced funding. Unfortunately, every year the funding seems to get tighter and the requirements seem to increase, so asset management will be even more important as we move forward. Trying to effectively manage a utility becomes very difficult when you don't have a thorough understanding of what you own, where it's located, and what condition it's in. With asset management, we want to think of our assets not as a collective, but in individual terms. For example, we don't want to think of a pump station as a whole, but rather consider each individual asset that makes up the pump station, such as the building, the pumps, the motor, the controls, valves, meters, etc. that are inside that pump station. 
Asset management thinking puts the customer at the center of all you do. It becomes all about the customers. Everything we do should be based on providing the customers what they want. Traditionally, we've thought of our jobs as managing assets and then, oh, by the way, we provide a customer service. What we need to do is think of our job as providing the customer service and, oh, by the way, we manage assets to be able to provide it. So it just flips our thinking kind of on its head. In order to spend your money in a more efficient way, it is necessary to understand which components of your system are more critical to your sustained performance. Understanding criticality allows you to spend your money and your time on the items that are causing the most risk to your organization. If you focus activities and spending according to criticality, you can spend the same amount of money and have a bigger impact on your system, or you can spend less money to achieve the same result. When we take the first three elements together, we understand what our assets are, what condition they're in, how long they will last, and how critical they are. We also understand what we want our assets to do for us. All of this information gives us the basis for deciding how we want to operate and maintain our assets to ensure long-term sustainability, and when we want to repair, rehabilitate, or replace them. This process allows us to make data-driven decisions about those aspects. We have to develop a long-term plan for how we will finance what we would like to do, and we have to develop techniques to communicate the need for funding to upper management, decision makers, and the public. We need them to understand what the money is needed for and what the risk is of not receiving the money. Ultimately, the decision is in the hands of our governing bodies, but we need to make sure they understand the full implications of their decisions. These five components, the current state of the assets, level of service, criticality, life cycle costing, and long-term funding, make up the asset management process. Today's webinar will focus on the first core component, the current state of the assets. Webinars two through five cover the other core components, and as I mentioned, you can access those on our website if you need to pick up information about any of the other core concepts. Asset management, as we just talked about, provides a common sense framework for decision making. It helps you make better decisions. It helps you determine how to make those decisions in a more data-driven manner. It's going to rely on the knowledge of the entire organization. So it's not just something that one person does. It's going to rely on the entire organization, whether that's one person or 500 people. It doesn't matter. It's going to collectively take all that knowledge and use it to, to do asset management. It's going to provide, <clears throat> provide the ability to pass on information. So it gets the information out of somebody's head and into paper or computer format so that you can actually use the information. Uh, we have a lot of issues with retiring uh, workforce. We need to make sure that we collect the information that those people have before they leave because otherwise the information leaves with them and we're left without having that knowledge. And finally, it can help move your organization away from a reactive operation to a much more proactive operation, meaning that you can get out of having to always uh, fight those fires that are coming up, and instead you can actually plan your day and plan the activities that you will be doing. It's going to help you maximize the value of the money that you spend. So the money you spend on your utility can be spent in the best way possible to reduce the overall risk of your organization and help, ha help you have a more sustainable operation. We will now show a video uh, from New Hampshire discussing how asset management helped them. Don, if you would, start the video. I came from a municipality that did not have this. I was brought up with base maps and, and uh, manhole numbers and stuff of that nature, and that's how you, know, you, you found what you were looking for. And with years of service, you, know, you, you retain that information so you know it. So but when I came from that to here, I didn't know the infrastructure, and this has been a great tool and asset for me, and how I have been able to um, understand and know all the different utilities of the infrastructure in the city of Summersworth. Um, when I first started in this position, there was a gasoline leak that got into the storm drain system. And with my, me communicating with her back here, I was able to find out what pipe along the river was the discharge in the drain system. We boomed off the, the different manholes that that pipe ran to, and we contained a gas fill. And that was done within a matter of 15, 20 minutes. We knew that all, all that information and had that all set up and done. 
Okay, starting in the, the core component of the current state of the assets, the first question we want to ask ourselves is what assets do you actually own? What are the physical things that make up your system? The tanks, the pumps, the pipes, the valves, the hydrants, all of those things that make up what you're trying to manage. Oftentimes we also think of our uh, utility workers as assets as well, but in this particular instance we're focusing more on the physical stuff uh, that you own. The next thing we want to think about is where are those assets? Where are they located? We have two different kinds of assets. One we call our vertical assets and those are things that we typically find in a building. They might be treatment units, they might be some pumps, and then we would want to know what building those um, assets are located in. We have other assets that we call our horizontal assets, and these assets are the things that are in the field. These are things like your pipe, your, your valves, your meters, your hydrants, stuff that's out physically located in your community. And in this case, we would like to have a map that shows the location of these, um, of these assets. Next, we want to know what condition your assets are in. Are they in very good condition, maybe almost new? Um, are they in moderate condition, maybe showing some signs of wear, having a few problems, or are they in very poor condition? Uh, the things that you would use to assess your condition are maintenance records, visual inspections, discussions with operators who have worked with that equipment, uh, past performance with the equipment, uh, past experience with similar equipment. Um, those types of things will help you determine what the condition of your assets is and to make a judgment about those conditions. And we're talking about you know, comparing a condition of one asset within your facility to another, not comparing your assets to somebody else's in a whole different system. Next we want to know what the remaining useful life of your assets is. Will they last you one year, 10 years, 50 years? How long could they remain in service still delivering the type of service that you need? This is very site specific. Uh, you may have a pump in your system that will only last you 10 years because of the environment that it's in, the weather conditions, that type of thing. Somebody else might have that very same pump and have it last twice as long as you. It's really based on what your specific conditions are. What is the nature of the water that it's dealing with? What are the soil conditions? Uh, what kind of atmosphere is it in? That will help you determine how much longer something will last in your specific installation. And then we want to know how much will it cost to replace your assets. So for example, if you have meters in your system, how much would it cost you to replace those meters? If you end up using a different technology, say for example radio read meters instead of uh, regular meters, you would want to know the replacement cost of the radio read meters. So if you end up doing something like replacing metallic pipe with plastic pipe, you would want to know the replacement cost of that plastic pipe. When we think about our assets and we talk about taking an inventory of all the assets that are in our system, we have to think about what is actually going to define an asset within our particular facility. Uh, we don't want to have every little nut and bolt in our system included in an asset inventory because that will end up generating way too many assets for us to handle. There are certain assets that are actually not worth tracking. So what we have to figure out is which assets in our system those would be. We might do it by setting a money amount and saying, well, anything that's less than, say, $500 or $300 or $1,000, depending on the size of your system, is something that we will not put in the system. We might also choose to define an asset as something we would write a work order on. So if it was an item that we would actually prepare a work order for, we would include it in our system. Um, so, for example, if we have a pump and the pump has a motor and we would write a work order on that motor, not just the pump, we would have the pump's motor in there as well as the pump. If we would also write a work order on the impeller within the pump, we would have the impeller in there as an asset. So we want to make sure if we're going to write work orders on assets that the assets uh, for which the work orders are generated are included in our system. We also might want to think about um, a hybrid of between money amounts and what's critical to our system. You might have a component in your system that's very important to you but doesn't reach the money amount we've set. So for example, we might set $1,000 as what defines an asset in our system, 
but we would have meters and hydrants in our system that may not reach that dollar amount. Well, the hydrants are very critical to us for firefighting purposes, flushing purposes, etc. So we would want to include those anyway. Furthermore, collectively, if you added all those hydrants up, they would certainly add up to much more than $1,000, so we would want to include them. Similarly, meters would be the same kind of thing, where a meter may not add up to $1,000, but it would be very important to us to include meters in our inventory because, again, they're very important to us, they're a part of how we generate revenue, and they also collectively add up to a lot of money. So think about different ways that you can define an asset within your system. Do you want to use money amounts? Do you want to use work orders? Do you want to use uh, criticality or importance or a combination thereof to figure out what defines an asset for you? Uh, the main thing is to make sure you have all your important assets in the system and that you don't have so many assets that you can't handle um, the upkeep and maintenance of your asset inventory. Now we have a poll question to see if you've had a chance to define assets at your utility. Um, so we have some options for you. We don't currently define assets. In other words, you haven't yet taken on this process of thinking about how you would define an asset. Um, you use some kind of monetary limit, um, you have some size limits, combination, other. So um, how might you define an asset at your utility? We'll give it about five more seconds. So we have about 32% that don't currently define assets, and we have 41% that use a combination. And I think that's probably the most common thing, is to have a combination of different kinds of uh, ways of defining an, a defining an asset, and maybe have a little bit, a combination between money and criticality and that type of thing. So that's, I think, a very common uh, response. Another thing that we wanted to do is create asset ID numbers. We want a way to identify each individual asset so that when we create an asset inventory of all of the things in our system, we can have a unique number that identifies those particular assets. Um, there are a number of ways that you can come up with asset ID numbers. Oftentimes we see a combination of letters and numbers that help describe what the particular asset is, where it's located, something about it. Um, so you can use combinations of letters and numbers. The main thing is to come up with a system that will work for you and will work for your collection of assets and that you can convey to others and they understand. And then furthermore, you want to make sure that each asset is individually numbered and that, as that number remains with that asset. So if you replace an asset, you give that replacement asset a new ID number so that we don't mix and match information. The ID number is going to be how you link information about your assets in different information sources, like you may have different databases or you may have a billing software that's different from your asset inventory, but the ID number for the meter would be the same in both places. You can see a couple of examples there of asset ID numbers where they're actually connected to the asset. Uh, in one case, there's metallic tags, and in the other case, there's plastic tags, and they have actually gone and attached those ID numbers to the equipment. That's a really good thing to do to make sure that the asset is tagged and the tag number goes with that particular asset so that when somebody is doing a work order, um, they can go right to that asset and they can see that tag number. So you don't have to start from scratch, which is kind of the beauty of asset management. You start with what you know, and you start with all the information sources that you have. And if you look around your facility, you will actually find out that you have quite a bit of information already. You may already have some kind of system maps. Perhaps you have as-built drawings. Perhaps you have maps that were hand-drawn. Um, perhaps you have some maps that you made um, with GIS. You can use any maps that you have and kind of collect them together and see you know, where the gaps are, where you need to fill in. You might have system records of you know, any number of kinds of records that might be there. Maintenance records, for example. You might have purchase records. You might have photographs of your system that you could use. 
Um, if you don't have those things, you can always do interviews with people who work at your facility now or who have worked at the facility in the past. You can ask them questions. You can record what they say. You can have them write something down. Uh, whatever is best for them and for you, you can collect the information from people. You know, ask them, you know, how many times did you repair the pipe on Main Street? Um, did you ever have any problems with the pumps that are in the um, Elm Street pump house? Just ask very specific questions and get as much information you can out of those interviews. You may have an existing inventory already or you may have an existing asset ID numbering system. If you like either of those, you should build on them and work from there. If they don't seem to be serving your needs, you can take the information out of it and put it into a new inventory process. But the main thing is to go around and look for what all you can uh, start with, look at all the information you have and kind of build from the initial information. Then you have a lot of options about how to store your asset information asset inventory information. You can use generic databases or spreadsheets, you know, something like Microsoft Excel or Microsoft Access or any of those other products. You can do a database that way. EPA has a program that they call CUPS, the Checkup Program for Small Systems. It's an asset inventory type program. You can download it for free from EPA's website. You can do your inventory on a commercial product. There are many, many products on the market. They cost anywhere from several hundred dollars to many um, tens of thousands of dollars and anything in between. Uh, the type of product you would buy would depend on what you want it to do. Uh, do you want it to be just an inventory? Do you want it to tie to a billing system? Do you want it to tie to a spare parts inventory? Do you want it to be a work order generation system? And the more you want your system to do, of course, the more money you might spend. But there are many, many systems on the market, and you can surely find one that would fit your needs and fit your price range. And lastly, if you don't have any of those other options and you don't have a very big system, you can always start your inventory on paper. You can always just write down what you have and start there and build over time. So don't ever feel like you can't get started. You can start wherever the technology you know, whatever technology you feel comfortable with, and then just build it over time. And we have a video of a group in southern New Mexico um, who did their inventory on a piece of paper. Matter of fact, our inventory right now is takes up about eight or ten pages, and there's probably 25 to 30 lines per page. And each each item each valve gives uh, a street address or a location of the street it's on. And it, if it says uh, an 80s valve and it says it's on Shedham Colony Trail, trail, we know it's on the main. And uh, we haven't got back with numbered uh, all of the valves starting on our uh, GPS system. So we'll have to take that plus the inventory that I've got and determine how we want to identify the valves and, and give them a permanent address and number. We're going to have another video now on where you can start your inventory, some suggestions from Dover, New Hampshire, of how you can get started in your inventory process. I started on something that you know. You know, like, well, I started on the hydrants. And that, you know, they're visual. You can find them easy. And, you know, start collecting the data on that kind of stuff. And then, uh, then once you get your feet wet and you kind of figure out how you're going to file it data-wise in the computer, then then your other assets just kind of fall into place. You know, it's, it's an easy. Well, you've done the worst exercise, so now uh, we can do this. You know, the worst part we're going to have, and that's where I got to look around, is how we ID our water mains and segments because they they don't go gate to gate a lot. Sometimes you have changes in material in the line so we got to look at how we're going to ID that and but that's something where I may reach out to other people that do asset management and say how you how you do that but that's but generally I would say find something that's small I recommend anybody in the water industry you know do your hydrants in the sewer industry do your mantles because those are the the visual and it's easy to find them you know then you can deal with the the pipeline after the fact. 
Okay, and we're going to show or um, do a video now that's about collecting asset data and give you some some tips on how you can collect this information in a in an easier way. Okay, here we are at the aeration basins of the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority's reclamation plant, and this is a good example here of the type of asset that we're collecting data on. Now you can see here, we've got many, many mixes. I don't know, there's probably 50 of them, maybe more. And it consists of the mixer themselves and the motor to run the mixer. Now when we first started this process, we actually came out with the rugged laptops and we had our electronic form built. We were gonna uh, fill out the information on the form, all the various fields that we have. But we found that that was not only cumbersome, but also we could actually speed up the process considerably if we just came out and took a picture of the asset as well as the asset nameplate that the manufacturer puts on and of course the asset tag number that we have assigned for that particular asset. And so we generally first take a picture of the entire asset and we try to include the, uh, the tag number in, in that picture as well but if we don't and we need to get a zoom in on it we can do that and get a close up of, of the actual tag number itself. Then over here on the side of the mixer, we've got our nameplate information. So we found that if we just go ahead and take a picture of this tag of this tag here, we go when we go back in the office, we have all the information we need, and we've got a permanent record of it because we've taken a picture. Since we've got so many of these and they're all really the same thing, a lot of the information that we're collecting on these is common. So we we can go back into the office and get into our access database and actually copy the common field information for each of these assets and it really speeds up the process of collecting data when you have multiples of the same thing. And typically throughout this plant and any other plant, you're going to have a lot of that. You're going to have 10, 12, 20 of the same thing and the only thing that will change is the tag number, the serial number, etc. So I want to comment on the advice that was given is to take pictures of your assets and I think that that's one of the best tips for how you can get started in your inventory process if you haven't started yet is to go out and take pictures of your assets. It will really help you and it also gives you that permanent record of you know what assets do I have, what do they look like. Now some of the assets like your hydrants, your meters, your uh, valves look very similar and it would be hard if you were taking pictures and didn't write down a lot of information it would be hard to sort of figure out where those particular assets were which valve was it which hydrant was it so something you can do is to take a whiteboard with you or maybe a piece of paper uh, whatever works for you but if you have a whiteboard and some markers you can actually write the address of where you are on a hydrant or a valve or a meter you could write the street number um, you could also put the the um, tag number for that particular asset. You could lay the whiteboard next to the hydrant or the meter or the valve and take the picture with that included so that you can have a little bit more visual reference of where you are. You could take pictures without it and with it so that you have both kinds of pictures and it helps you with identifying when you get back to the office if you haven't you know, written down all the good information about where things were in a photo log, you know, um, this can help you figure out where those pictures were taken. So again, I highly recommend that you go out and get a digital camera or use your cell phone or your iPad or whatever you might have that has digital photo capabilities. Take some pictures and you know have those for your asset inventory process to help you through that process. And as was mentioned, if there's any kind of tag numbers, uh, or tags from the manufacturer, make sure you get a picture of those because that will help you again have that permanent record of that information and to fill out your asset inventory. When you collect your asset information, one thing to think about is that you only want to collect the information that you're going to use. You want to make sure that you're very careful not to collect information that will take a lot of time to, main to collect and maintain and won't provide a lot of benefit to you. Um, so for example, if it doesn't really matter to you what color a hydrant is because that's not really important, you don't need to collect that information. You would want to know things like the manufacturer, the condition, the year of installation, things like that. But you don't need to put in 
500 pieces of information about every asset. You want to focus in on what is the information that will help me in the future? What can I collect that will make it easier for, you, for me in the future? You want to make sure you keep your information updated. So once you put your information into, the, into your inventory process, whatever kind of inventory you have, you don't want to forget about it and say, I'm never going to go back and use that information again. You want to make sure that it gets kept updated. So if you find out that you put in, say something was a six inch cast iron pipe, they go out to do maintenance on it and they find out that it's a four inch steel pipe. You want to make sure that that gets updated in your inventory. You don't want to leave it as the wrong thing. Or if something changes, you replace an asset, um, something happens to an asset, you want to make sure you keep that information updated at all times so that you have a very accurate record. And finally, you want to think about quality of the information that you put in. It's actually better to have less information of higher quality than more information of a lower quality. The information that you're putting into your asset inventory is going to be used in part to help you make decisions on the, in the future about whether to repair, replace, or rehabilitate your assets. Those decisions have a monetary implication. So you really want to make sure that you have quality data so that the, the decisions that you make based on that data are the best decisions you can have. It's clear that you're not going to have 100% perfect information. Nobody ever does, nobody ever will. But you want to just have the best quality that you can. So keep that in mind as you're doing your inventory process to make sure that you're collecting information that's important, you're keeping it updated, and that you're putting as good a quality information as you can into your system. So now we've come to the part where we want to think a little bit about what are you going to do at your own facility based on um, hearing about the asset management process. One of the first things you can do is look to develop a team of individuals that can, that can help you with the asset management process. And depending on the size of your system, you can have a lot of people or a few people. Um, you want to have a cross-section if you have multiple people and get finance people, management people, operators. You want to make sure you have a nice cross-section of people because that will help you in getting all the information you need to move forward with your program. Next, you want to establish your baseline. Where are you right now in the asset management process? We have developed a tool called the Asset Management IQ process that will help you figuring out where you are today and help you measure your progress in your asset management journey. There's an interactive asset management IQ that's on our website. You can also download a PDF version of the IQ and take it on paper if you prefer. The IQ consists of 30 questions. It's six different sections with five questions per section. And there's one general section and then each of the core concepts has a section. And you go through and answer the questions. There's a point total from 0 to 5. And you just figure out where you rate on that scale. And at the end, it will calculate your overall score and tell you kind of where you are right now today before you start your asset management activities. What this will help you do is in the future, as you go forward with doing asset inventories or setting level service goals or anything else that you're going to do, you can take the IQ later, say six months, a year from now, and then you can see where you've made progress, and you can also see where your weaknesses are. So it really helps you determine where you are and where you need to go in your process, and then measure your progress as you move along. Another thing you can do is start to gather your existing information sources. Look around for what you have that you can work from. Gather it together. What kind of reports, what kind of maps, what kind of... Um, personnel records or maintenance records or whatever do you have available to help you kind of get started in your asset management process. You can also think about how you are going to choose to define an asset. You can think about what makes the most sense for your particular utility. And you can always change it, so don't be afraid to pick something and then if that doesn't work for you, adjust it. So for example, we had a utility that chose $500 as how they were going to define an asset. After they got through the inventory process, they realized that they kind of went a little overboard and had too many assets in the system, and some of the assets they were tracking really were not worth tracking. They changed their money amount to $1,000 and found that to be a much more reasonable 
uh, method of defining an asset for them. So if you get started and you think that it didn't quite work for you, go ahead and change it. Or if you think there are particular assets that got left out that needed to be included, think about how you might change that so that you can include all the assets that are important to you. Uh, next, take pictures of your assets. And again, just to stress what we talked about before, um, this is a really good way to get started on your inventory process. It will really help you, and it will help you get that permanent record of what you have in your system and what you're currently managing. With the mapping, you want to collect what your existing maps look like, what kind of maps do you have, how much of your system does it cover, and then think about what is missing. Are there particular parts of your facility that are not covered in a map anywhere? Maybe some older construction that you don't have any mapping for. Maybe there's certain parts of your system that didn't ever get mapped. Or maybe it's not accurate and you know there's certain pieces of your mapping that is not accurate. How can you fill in those gaps in the future? Uh, is there are there ways that you can use to try to fill in those gaps? So we have another poll question that if you were to get started in your asset management journey, which step would you implement first? So your choices are to develop your team, establish your baseline using the AMIQ tool, gather your existing information sources, choose how to define an asset, or take pictures of your assets. So if you were going to start your asset management journey, which step would you implement first? Couple more seconds. So we have quite a few, 58% who have picked develop your team, and that's a really good starting point because you can at least see who can support you in your efforts, who has information that can help you, and you know really work together to get it started. Uh, we also have 21% how to define your what an asset is. That's another good place to start because you can then think about you know what is that going to set up in terms of how much information I'm going to collect, how many assets I'm going to have. We have 13% that are going to gather their existing information, another excellent starting point, and 8% that are going to um, establish their baseline using the AMIQ tool. And again, if you go to the website address, and we will provide that at the end of this webinar to everybody who registered, we will provide you with the link to get that asset management IQ. And it's, a, it's something that you definitely want to do before you get too far along in your asset management journey, because you want to know where your starting point was. This particular webinar was based on asset management, which is part of our small, uh, smart management for small water system project. But as I mentioned at the beginning, we actually have other uh, managerial financial capacity issues that we work with. So we give, we're going to give you a chance to answer a poll question regarding what, what other assistance you might be interested in. Um, regarding these other topics. You can actually pick any that apply, so this is not just choose one this time. You can choose any of the following topics, rates and finance, water loss, water system collaboration, multiple funding, or energy efficiency. So any of those that you think would be uh, worthwhile to have assistance in for you, uh, please, please click on uh, whichever responses apply. Okay. Okay, I wanted to make you aware of some upcoming workshops or upcoming webinars, I'm sorry. Um, on the 7th, we have a leadership part two workshop. This is on effective messaging. So if you would like to hear about that, um, join us for that webinar. We have a water system partnership and regionalization webinar. Um, that's the water company model. That's on March 12th. 
On March 17th and 31st, we have the part two and part three of our water loss um, reduction workshops. And you can register for any of these workshops at efcnetwork.org slash upcoming. Um, and they're all free, of course, and so any of those topics that are of interest to you, uh, please go ahead and register there. If there are any webinars that you have an interest in that you weren't able to attend, again, you can find the recorded webinars on that website as well, and you can download and watch those. We want to thank EPA for providing funding for this project and allowing us to do the in-person trainings and the webinars. And I wanted to put our contact information up here so that if you have questions after this webinar or if anything comes up, you can either contact myself or Don Nall with any questions and our email addresses are there. Um, and we will follow up with each of the attendees and registrants of this webinar uh, with information on how you can access the AMIQ and some other resources. Um, so you will be receiving uh, contact from us and also requesting, uh, giving you a chance to request, request assistance with asset management. So Don, at this time I'll ask you if any questions have come in during the webinar that we need to answer. Yes, we do. Um, so the first question we have is from Curtis and he asks, isn't GIS mapping your entire system and assets the, the best way to start the asset management process? And then he has a comment, this seems to be the best way to figure out what you have and where it is. I would say that if you have access to GIS technology, that is a great way to start the process. And if you have a GIS map, it is a fantastic place to start. The problem is that many small systems especially um, do not have access to GIS mapping. They either don't have the technology or they don't have the people who can run the GIS system. And so it makes it more difficult for them to start at that point. But certainly if you have access or you know how to access GIS mapping, I would agree that it's a great starting point. But we're trying to um, work with very small systems who oftentimes do not have access to GIS or can't afford the licensing fee or don't have anybody on staff that can actually do the GIS mapping. So it is one way to do it, but I would say it's not the only way to do it. And we had a comment come in about that. It says, most states only allow professional surveyors to perform GPS or GIS services, so be careful. Yeah, and that is something that could be a problem. Um, there is survey grade GIS that's done that can get quite expensive. Um, so you want to be careful if you go down that route. Um, but I think for the asset management purposes, generally speaking, you don't need quite that much quality. Um, you really have to decide, you know, what are you going to use the map for? <clears throat> and that will decide, <clears throat> excuse me, that will decide the accuracy that you need within your map. And I wanted to point out that um, the survey link has been posted up in the chat um, to take the survey evaluation at the conclusion of the webinar. So please take a minute to note that web address and we would certainly appreciate it if you would take just a couple of minutes to fill out an evaluation to let us know um, how we did with the webinar and any feedback that you'd like to provide us. Um, I haven't had any other questions come in at this point. Okay, well with that um, we will wish you a good afternoon and thank you for attending the webinar and again we'll send you some resources um, as a follow-up to this and if you could fill out the survey that would be great. Uh, thank you all for attending and the uh, webinar will be posted on efcnetwork.org. Thank you. Thanks everyone.